welcome to ABA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and with me as always are my fabulous co-hosts. Hi, it's me, Jackie. Hello, it's Anna. Sorry. <laughs> my ear is really bothering me today. Was, Mornings uh-oh. are tough, but it's okay. I was like... I heard something. I appreciated that you were leaning on your on your mouth when you I did know. your introduction it's too, Jay. <laughs> from the depths. <laughs> I'm here. We we're having a very in-depth audio quality conversation <laughs> before, uh, you know, the Likert scale of audio sounds fine. I think you guys are usually at the four or five. Yeah, it's it's all great, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but speaking of great audio equipment and folks talking to us over the internet on this uh, Behavior Analyst podcast. What? No, that's not the title. A, a podcast about behavior analysis in which every week we discuss research related to the field. I forgot what my segue was because uh, a little peek behind the curtain, we're recording a slightly different time, which apparently is, is hugely important to how I do an introduction. So why don't we get to our very important topic without too much hullabaloo, and that is going to be talking about advances in trauma-informed care, and we have two special guests coming to us across the interwebs. We have Dr. Adityan Rajaraman and Dr. Jennifer Austin joining us today. Hello, how are you both doing? Doing great, thank you. Yes, hi, thank you for having us. Of course. So, long-time listeners of the show, I don't know how long you'd have to have listened at this point, because I don't know how old any of our episodes are. You might remember that D2 was on before, talking about the ISCA. It was what back episode? when we called it the ISCA, so it's yeah. no longer the ISCA. I know it's not the ISCA. I, I do know. know. It was episode 110. It was 110. Episode 110. Okay, so almost half of our episodes mm-hmm. ago at this point. Wow. Time flies when you're having fun, I guess. And then, Jennifer, this is your first time on the show, so thank you so much for making the time to come on and talk to us all about uh, trauma-informed care. Thanks for inviting me. So before we get into our articles that we'll be discussing and then the topics themselves, let's learn a little bit more about both of you. So, Dietje, you can do your whole spiel again, or if you want to just do an update for longtime listeners, it's like it's like a reward for having listened to the whole way through. They only get the update, you know? Sure. Uh, I'd love to defer to Jen so that she could introduce herself first, because I've already had a chance to. Excellent. Oh, thanks, Ditu. Well, I earned my PhD a number of years ago at Florida State University under the expert supervision of John Bailey. I've been a behavior analyst for over 20 years now, and much of that time has been spent working with children and adolescents with emotional and behavioral disorders, particularly in school context. But over the past few years, I've been working more and more with kids with known histories of abuse and neglect, as well as expanding some of my behavior analytic work to prisons. And I'm currently professor of psychology and head of behavior analysis at the University of South Wales in the UK. Excellent. Awesome. You got to follow that. Yeah, I know, right? (laughs) (laughs) And I, my name is Ditu Rajaraman. I've been on here before and I'm so happy to be back. I received my kind of doctoral training at Western New England University studying under Greg Hanley. And that's where I learned how to assess and treat dangerous behavior using a particular kind of set of methods. And that kind of has has driven my my research identity, I think, to this day. I'm currently an assistant professor at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County in Baltimore, Maryland, where I teach and mentor undergraduate and graduate students in behavior analysis, do a little bit of research on kind of trying to develop and refine trauma-informed ways of assessing and treating dangerous behavior and some other projects on the side. And I guess my, my latest update is that I'm excited to, to report that I'm actually going to be transitioning down to Vanderbilt University Medical Center this summer to help join a faculty position in their Department of Pediatrics and also serve as the Director of Behavior Analysis Research at this wonderful organization called the Treatment and Research Institute for Autism Spectrum Disorders, a.k.a. TRIAD, a.k.a. wonderful acronym. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's I did not know this. Yeah. I haven't been following you as closely as I should. I know, Jack, uh, you usually that, I mean, know I, about I those. I get Google updates pushed right to my phone. <laughs> <laughs> but that's awesome. Congrats. Thank you. Go you. That is great. Thank you. I'm really excited. They got they got a great squad down there, and they they do just all sorts of comprehensive services for for autism from from diagnosis to like adult planning and adult services across the span. And they've just been really keen on increasing, elevating their research profile. So, so kind of my, I'm, I'm going in there as a role player to to sort of just try to help do, bring the great work that they're doing to a, to a dissemination. Excellent. Very good. 
Well, you have a separate section in the organization that's just set up to be called the dissemination station. That'd be really. <laughs> I hope really... so. I'm gonna, I'm gonna need a button that gets the sound effect that you guys provide. <laughs> you know what? I, I can help you with that. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll license that really professional sound and quality audio to you. Don't worry. <laughs> My mouth would be very happy to make it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, great. Well, now that we know a little bit more about you, and I, I don't know if that exactly tells us why we would be talking about today's topic, because it, it is such a broad topic. I think it's one that's been it's been really hot. It's been in the news a lot lately, and I think for very good reason. And that is going to be talking about trauma-informed care. So we'll be talking about two articles, one kind of a little bit more for background and one that both of you were the primary authors on. So, Dinah, what are we going to be talking about today. Sure. Well, we have two articles to review today. The first is, I guess I'll st- I'm going to start with the meat and then the potatoes. That's yeah. Fine. Okay. So the first, the meat article that we're going to review today is toward a trauma informed applications of behavior analysis by Rajaraman, Austin, Gover, Camilleri, Donnelly, and Hanley published in Java 2022. Ooh, so recent. So fresh. (laughs) And then our potatoes article, which will just uh, supplement our discussion, is compassionate care and behavior analytic treatment. Can outcomes be enhanced by attending to relationships with caregivers by Taylor, LeBlanc, and Nosek, published in BAP 2019. And I know that this article has been sprinkled throughout several of discussions that Mm -hmm. we've had. Mm -hmm. So it's an excellent article. All right. I'm so excited for this conversation. (laughs) So, you know, I guess the the place to start is if you wouldn't mind both sharing kind of why you think trauma-informed care is an important topic, both for the field, but then also something that you, you know, took all the time to write like a very thorough review and, you know, discussion of frameworks that practitioners could, could use. So very, something very practical, I think, for the, you know, the, the average clinician, like why, why was that something that just, just spoke directly to you? Yeah, thanks for asking that. I think it kind of was a confluence of events. For me personally, I've I've, I've done nothing but reflect on some of my earlier experiences and training in behavior analysis. And I was, I know that I was incredibly blessed and fortunate to to get have gotten my training at at kind of at an institute called the New England Center for Children, where we serve some some of the children with some of the most significant behavioral challenges in the region. And we worked with kids who were quite literally too dangerous to be living at home. And we also were in a setting where we had sensibly the resources to address those dangerous behaviors. And since I've left those settings, I've worked in other such settings. I've consulted in public schools and homes and in other contexts. And I've seen how similar procedures that are vetted and and kind of are refined uh, at s- settings like the New England Center, how they work and how they don't work kind of in other settings. And one of the things that really always jumped out at me was this, is the notion that when we treat problem behavior, sometimes we induce more pro- problem behavior. In in the name of ABA, when we try to kind of put procedures in place to try to reduce certain behaviors, we inadvertently end up creating sometimes unsafe situations and dangerous situations. And those kind of moments really stuck with me. And especially as I started doing ABA in other settings, like, I don't know, telehealth in the home in a a small apartment in India, it it really jumped out at me that, that some of the procedures that we kind of deem best practice may not necessarily be appropriate. And when I say confluence of events, I, I juxtapose that with sort of the ongoing public conversation about the very real and, and perceived experiences of ABA as as traumatizing, abusive, and violent. And I think something connected there when it's when when you are kind of in a culture, you, you're not necessarily thinking outside of your own bubble. And mm-hmm. I think that we're, we're kind of brought into these cultures thinking, well, we do this stuff because it's necessary, because it's best practice, because it's evidence-based. But it just takes like one step outside of that to say, wow, public perception of this is, is not great. And, and in fact, would I want this to, to be the way that kind of my brother or my sister were treated if they were receiving ABA services? And so for those reasons, kind of coming up with language and a vocabulary and then ideally a technology for delivering ABA in a way that kind of obviates the need for those kinds of tense, terse altercations and interactions seemed incredibly important. And it also just, it seems like it's the way for us to not only communicate with audiences that may not be fans of ABA, but it also just seems like the right way to sort of treat clients that we serve. 
Yeah, I think for me, my my experience is, is somewhat similar to Ditu's. And I think my interest in this topic was really prompted by reflecting on my own clinical practice. And I think in particular, what I would consider some of my clinical failures, um, if, if I'm being honest. Much of my work, as I mentioned before, in both the U.S. and the U.K. has been focused on working with teachers and children and families and high-risk areas, specifically areas with high poverty, lower levels of education, and fewer support resources in general. And, and of course, prevalence of, of trauma is, is likely to be higher in some of those environments. And what I sometimes found was that the behavioral strategies that should have worked with particular kids simply did not. And as Ditu said, even worse, they seem to sometimes make problems worse and cause genuine distress. And I also had experience of working with foster and adoptive families who had children with known histories of abuse or neglect and infant infancy, but were placed in stable, loving environments and toddlerhood. And despite what we would consider good, high integrity, behavior-based parenting, these children continue to have substantial behavior issues. And it was these children in particular that began to really shape my thinking about behavior analysis and my practice and solidified the fact that we might need to be doing di things differently as behavior analysts who work with people with trauma histories. So, you know, I guess a great question that, that I, I, I always like answered because I, I feel, and, and you bring this up in the paper, that it's, you know, we're pulling from so many different fields and even in those fields... We're not seeing, you know, here's the answer, right, <laughs> for what, you know, what is trauma leads me to kind of that question of like, what, you know, what, what are we thinking about when we are talking about trauma, when we're having this conversation? Because I think trauma is one of those terms that has a specific meaning and has something observable occurring when trauma, you know, is part of the learner's history, but also is a term that kind of gets colloquially thrown around like, oh, something bad happened. Like, that's all there is to it. Like, mm, something bad happened. That was too bad. Man, this pandemic, we're all been traumatized anyway. Mm -hmm. Let's just business as usual after that. So could you define a little bit more what trauma means and what might constitute you know, a, tra a traumatic event in terms of how we, how we would use that information to improve our practice? Yeah, I think it's a really great observation that we sort of throw it around colloquially. And, and, and I think that that might be kind of not a bad thing necessarily because trauma, if you look at kind of the, the authorities, the, 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 the white books that have sort of been written about trauma-informed care and researchers that have been focusing on trauma, you know, since the Vietnam War or before, they typically define it as, as you know, an event or series of events that has lasting adverse impacts on an individual's functioning, be it behavioral, be it emotional, be it spiritual. It's, it's loosely defined in, in the sense that it is some sort of event that has some sort of impact. And I think that that actually <laughs> works pretty well within a behavior analytic worldview because we tend to understand stimuli and behavior to be just that, that, that one, a stimulus doesn't have a particular effect on behavior because it is a particular stimulus. It does based upon a, a certain interaction with those stimuli and things like that. Essentially, like our, our behavior analytics commitment to function over structure, I think, is relevant to a conversation about what trauma is or is not. That said, in early research on trying to develop kind of guidelines for what constitutes a traumatic event, especially in children, researchers put out sort of like, here are the go-tos, here are some big common themes, abuse, neglect, of like, you know, violence, th things of that nature. But I think that it's it's worthwhile for us to consider that that uh, that many different events can serve as traumatizing. So mm -hmm. you can have an event that it's experienced as traumatizing, and then when it really does impact your day-to-day -day functioning when it becomes uh, so so adverse that you're kind of not able to carry out your day. I think that that's when we talk about perhaps going to get a diagnosis of something like post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm -hmm. So maybe those two things are a bit different. Trauma can sort of be the the experience of an event and that has a particular impact once it starts to go down the line and you're and you're you're not able to to engage in the same activities that you were before then we might call that something worth, you know, receiving a little bit of treatment and help with. No. When we're thinking about about trauma, I, I know, like Jen, you mentioned one of the kind of in, in the background, you know, your background, why you're interested in this topic, the sense that sometimes 
the procedures that science says should just totally work for whatever the problem is within, you know, within, within your client's life just doesn't, doesn't seem to do the job, doesn't seem to, to be effective. Could, would you mind talking a little more specifically about how that relates to trauma? You know, what are the you know, real adverse effects of trauma when it comes to, you know, providing services to our population, to the populations we, we often work with? So, you know, children, people with developmental disabilities. Yeah, so there is, as Ditu alluded to, there's a ton of research on the effects of trauma because events that are experienced as traumatic can affect people in so many different ways from our ability to form meaningful social relationships. There's a lot on on issues of attachment, our physical and mental health to our experience of the world more generally. And those disruptions to our social and physiological Logical development follow us into adulthood, sometimes even without our awareness. I think really a must-read article for understanding some of those lifelong effects of childhood trauma is the Felitti et al. paper on adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs, which was published in the American Journal of Preventative Medicine in 1998. And two things that will really hit home when you read that paper is one is the sheer prevalence of childhood trauma in the general population, and the other is the degree to which childhood trauma puts individuals at substantially greater risk for a range of mental mental and physical health problems later in life. And those include the usual suspects, the things that you would would guess would be effects of, of trauma, such as depression. And, and substance abuse, but also ones that you might not suspect, such as cardiovascular disease and cancer. And Dr. Nadine Burke Harris and others have actually talked about childhood trauma as one of the greatest health risks to society today. So the, so the stakes are high, and behavior analysts certainly have a role to play in supporting people who have experienced trauma. But I think that the research is, is falling behind in terms of really informing our practice. And although I can share lots of anecdotes with you about how my practice has been shaped by some of these experiences, and I probably will do that at some point (laughs) uh, during the podcast today, we're a little light on the ground in terms of research. Mm -hmm. I know, I think you mentioned in in your in your paper that even looking, I think I'm trying to remember the author, but there was you know an, an attempt to make either a meta analysis or a review of the the literature on you know like effective trauma treatments, and I, I I didn't see the actual study, but it just you just stated that they couldn't find one you know you know one paper with enough of the, oh, sort yeah, of those yeah. the benchmarks to even write. I mean, was it like a one page paper? I'm curious what that. That's looks right. Like. I know. I want to. I want to be able to get an authorship on a paper like that, but. <laughs> <laughs> Maynard or Maynard et al. 2018, and they, they tried to look for basically trauma-informed procedures and their impact in school settings or, or with school populations, and, and they couldn't find a study that met kind of search criteria yeah. or oh. inclusion criteria. Yeah, that's that's right? the that's the tip for the grad school students. Find <laughs> something no one's done any research whatsoever on and do a review paper. It'll be real short, but then it'll get cited. It's like, man, we need more research. <laughs> if I could just kind of go back and say one closing thought on on sort of how all of this relates to, to ABA. Mm-hmm. It's it's what given that the definition of trauma is somewhat open ended. I think that there's sort of like it's like is every event that we experience traumatizing? I think the answer is no. Can any event? kind of serve as traumatizing to an individual based on their unique interaction with it. Yes. And I think mm-hmm. that relates to a lot about how, how we practice ABA because we we are in we deal in programming events and arranging environments and 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 unique kind of stimuli for our clients to interact with. And mm-hmm. so so that that to me is sort of the what we get to take away from this definition of trauma that might serve as as a useful guide for how we practice. So you know as a field I think you know, behavior behavior analysts are sort of seen as very smart, very wise. We have lots of great effective treatments, but maybe not the nicest clinicians in some ways. You know, we have the answers. We'll tell you what they are. You need to do our procedures or you won't see the success. You know, some of that came out in, in you know, Bridget Taylor's you know, 2018 study in terms of, you know, that survey of like, well, what are behavior analysts not good at? In the areas of like taking the time to talk about how everyone's doing, you know, showing compassion were sort of our weak areas. Do you see trauma-informed care as different than or an extension of 
or maybe even a compliment to that idea of compassionate care? I mean, do the two go together? Or, or, or are we talking about sort of two separate but related kind of skill sets, maybe? I think that there's a lot of overlap between those two things. I think wherever we start as behavior analysts, we ought to start with compassion. And I think that we aren't always known for doing that. And that's unfortunate. And that's why it's so nice to see papers like like Bridget's who are really bringing that to the forefront in terms of saying, it's not just the technical skills that you have, it's the, the professionalism and kind of human skills that you have that make a difference. And I think one of the things that they do really well in that paper is highlighting how we need to take a more compassionate approach to understand the experience of of people who will need to implement our our interventions and, and particularly parents. But I think we also need to do a better job of considering how our interventions are experienced by the people who are the actual clients and what those interventions might mean to them. For example, imagine you're a child with, and your history with adults is sometimes they're here and meet my needs, and sometimes they are gone for days and I am cold, dirty, and hungry. So for them, adults are unpredictable, and their absence typically signals discomfort and anxiety about when my needs are going to be met again. So now imagine using something like timeout or an attention extinction procedure for that child, particularly for a behavior such as a tantrum, which is what a lot of behavior (laughs) analysts would recommend for behavior that appears to be attention maintained. From the child's perspective, those procedures may confirm what they know about adults, namely that they abandon you during times of need and distress. And so... Much of the change in my own practice with respect to children who've experienced abuse and neglect has been driven by my own experience and by by reading about trauma and, and other disciplines. So, you know, again, behavior analysis as a field, I think we need to be focusing more on what types of adaptations might be needed for behavioral strategies so that they can be maximally effective for these types of children and importantly, that they don't re-traumatize. Yeah, one thing I really loved about this paper that you brought up, I think, so many times, which I appreciated, is that we shouldn't, we don't need to know if a child had a trauma history, right? We should just be acting as if they did, because we as behavior analysts might not have that knowledge. When I when I read that, I was just like, yes, like why aren't we just acting in this loving, compassion way, compassionate way to all kids? Because Like I, you know, being a parent, starting that off, you know, working with like very young children, you don't want like their first experience with someone outside the home to be aversive. And I just, I was like, Ooh, I think I did a little yes. And then had a little (laughs) cry over it and then felt like empowered to, to, to do something different. And Mm. so thanks for that. Yeah. That's one of the reasons I like when I get the chance to work with you know, young children or preschool age children, because you can take the time to play, learn what they like to do. And no one's like, come on, come on. We got it. We got to get to trigonometry. Hurry it up. Let's, let's, let's speed things up here. They they don't like trigonometry and you need to fix that. You know, it's, it's, it's it's kind of the irrelevant problem at that point. You can take that time to be compassionate, to give them choice and preference. I find it incredibly humbling to to think of ourselves as behavior change agents. Like we, we we're given this immense privilege to study this science and use it to do good and help people. But it wasn't too long ago, and and maybe it's it's still happening today, where like behavior modification was being conflated with fascism, and mm-hmm. this idea that if you are, if you just because you have the capacity to change behavior with some sort of with science, it doesn't mean that it's the right thing to do. And so both of these kind of these notes, this compassionate care and the trauma-informed care note are largely about trying to protect ourselves from controlling other people's behavior without necessarily their their okay, their consent, their assent. And that really ties in what Skinner always said, right? So if we're going back to like where we all began, like Skinner wasn't all about, they said, yeah, we can, but should we, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I think tying it back to our roots, like... (laughs) That's right. Yes. And Jonathan Van Ness as well says, just because you a Mary can doesn't mean you a Mary should. (laughs) (laughs) 
JVN. Just Skinner two, and JVN. Two right? literary laureates of our time. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> That's awesome. I would love to see them holding hands and then JVN being like, Skinner, your hair is so fluffy. Maybe you should use an instant serum. <laughs> He did oh. have some fluffy hair, though. Yeah. Whew. And all those, yeah, all those pictures. Yeah. I was going to say, I think these are all really good points. I, I also think that there are, you know, things that we often are tackle within our practices or asked to tackle within our practices that we may not necessarily realize could be traumatic, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And maybe we're heading here in this discussion, but mm-hmm. something like potty training, right? Eventually, everyone's going to at least try. <laughs> The potty training route and you don't necessarily know right like how that's going to impact a child and you don't know if there's something about that environment that's you know really scary to them or it's you know cold in there or the lights are too bright right like there's a lot of pieces there that we don't necessarily have as much control over as we'd like to or our clients we don't necessarily have a good way of yet knowing from them what is really aversive right so how do we just compassionately approach those situations, even when we have the best intentions in mind and try to be responsive to potentially traumatic aspects of, you know, what you kind of need to learn in mm-hmm. life? Mm-hmm. Question mark. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be a little bit better at taking that time as as you said Rob around spending time with with people and getting to know them instead of just trying to get to work the meet, the minute that that we meet them and and being sensitive to to that distress and taking it as genuine as opposed to just something that you put on extinction and and move forward from I think also as behavior analysts, we need to get a little more comfortable with asking about trauma histories because recently with some students of mine, we did a survey that over 400 behavior analysts responded to around working with with people who who have experienced trauma. And the majority of them reported that they weren't comfortable asking about a trauma history because that doesn't really seem to be within our remit as as behavior analysts. But the more that we know about our clients and what might is, you know, is, as you said, Diana, be frightening to them or uncomfortable to them. And it goes back to that idea of compassionate care is respecting those things and working around them instead of just thinking we have to work through them. Mm -hmm. Just going on a bear hunt. We don't need to go through it. We Mm -hmm. actually can go over it or around it. Yeah. So it's about being you know, really observant and looking for any nuances or changes in behavioral profile for our students so that we can be as quickly response responsive and pivoting in any of those types of situations. Absolutely. So, you know, when we're talking about trauma-informed care, trauma-informed practices, you know, maybe making some assumptions about trauma being a part of the learner's history. I think one of the challenges I know for me personally as a professional that I've always had when it comes to trauma, learning about trauma, has related more to the sense that it feels like there are lots of responses that one can have to trauma. Like you mentioned in the paper, there's the idea of, you know, there are are trauma-specific treatments and how that is different than, say, a trauma-informed approach. Could you talk a little bit about why that's different? Because I know for me, I always feel I hear trauma. I'm like, mm, I don't know how to do that. Like that's that's not my my area of expertise. That's a medical thing, or that's a you know psychological versus behavioral issue. Are, are there are there differences when we're sort of conceptualizing trauma informed versus say trauma specific treatments? A- absolutely, they're, they're, it's kind of like fundamentally different. It, it, to tra- trauma specific services kind of refer to exactly what you just just described, Robert, like somebody receives a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder or a related diagnosis, and then they go to visit a therapist to receive services for those particular issues. Someone has a a trauma around being around men, and they might go and receive treatment on how to specifically overcome, say, a phobia or something, something like that. And also how to navigate the all of the the many different cognitive and mental and emotional challenges that, that come along for the ride with that. Mm-hmm. Trauma-informed care, by contrast, is more of a, a preventative and kind of broader framework. 
that can be applied in various different settings that human service settings that, that serve any individuals, but specifically kind of vulnerable populations. Trauma informed care refers to this kind of preventative framework that is largely geared at minimizing the likelihood of re-traumatization for individuals who may have been or may be at risk for experiencing trauma. And is also geared at facilitating, I think, participation in a therapeutic process that may help overcome certain, you know, challenges that those individuals are facing. So, okay. so trauma-informed care, I, I think it's fair to say that it doesn't necessarily prescribe a specific set of procedures per se. Rather, it's it prescribes commitments and then certain strategies that may make, that may help you actualize those commitments. And when you were looking into developing the framework together and, and, and with your other co-authors, you know, you, you put out in the paper, you know, some other reasons too why behavior analysts or behavior analysis as a field might want to sort of like, let's not have this discussion, shall we? You know, w- would you mind kind of going through kind of the three main topics that you brought up as like, these are these are probably some barriers to why some of our practitioners are going to be a bit hesitant to to want to have this discussion. Or why we haven't had this Or why we haven't right? had this I think, discussion. I think that might be more... I hope yeah. it might be more right. Why we haven't up to this time had these discussions. Mm-hmm. I'm negging. I'm negging our listeners. They don't want to be one of those hypothetical <laughs> practitioners who doesn't want to talk about trauma. They totally do. I think that if you look at other human service professions, behavior analysis is really lagging behind in terms mm-hmm. of of discussing trauma. So when we wrote the paper, that was one of the things that we really had to grapple with and and try to hypothesize why that might be the the case. And we point to three reasons, and there there certainly could be more. But I think one of the things is that trauma is usually conceptualized as an internal causal event, which can put behavior analysts in in somewhat uncomfortable territory. Our Um, monocle's flying off everywhere, (laughs) swooning everywhere. I'm like, ooh, gotta go. (laughs) But we know that trauma manifests itself in a number of external ways which may allow us to look at at trauma more functionally as as behavior analysts. But having said that, it is important to acknowledge the lasting effects of trauma and how those inaugural or early experiences may affect current contingencies. And I think that brings us on to another difficulty, which is as behavior analysts, we are trained to focus on the here and now, the immediate environmental events, because we know that any behavior that's occurring or not occurring is a function of those events. No matter where it came from, it's somehow being maintained by current environmental (laughs) contingencies. However, and something that we argue in the paper is that behavior analysts also need to consider how those more remote events may change the meaning of more immediate variables. So similar to what I was talking about before for a child who's who's maybe experienced neglect. So it's about pulling the lens back a bit more so that we see the bigger picture and not the immediate contingencies. And I think that's a real step change for some behavior analysts. And it certainly was for me. And Ditu and I have have talked about our own personal experiences with first hearing about trauma years ago and kind of thinking that's not really relevant because whatever is happening right now, right here and right now is the most important thing. And I think what working with children who've experienced trauma has taught me is that it's more than what is going on right here, right now. My practices have, have really evolved because I was once one of those behavior analysts who thought we can't change the past, so let's get on with changing the here and now. And while that's true that we can't change the past, we certainly need to acknowledge the massive role that trauma can play on someone's experience of the environment and the environment that we are creating for them. Very importantly. Mm -hmm. So we need to know about those events and we have to get more comfortable about asking about those events as standard practice. And then the third one, which we've talked about already, and it's a big one, (laughs) is is the lack of data. 
The components of a TIC approach vary greatly across the the literature. We tried to distill them into something that we felt made sense in a behavior analytic context, but there's certainly a wide variety of of what people would consider components of trauma-informed care. And as we noted before, very little evidence that applying a TIC approach results in better outcomes for clients. A lot of the research has been focused on Are people more aware of trauma when we used a trauma-informed care model, but whether or not those outcomes for clients are any better is has yet to be seen. But I think, and and this is a point that that we make in the paper, is that a lack of evidence doesn't necessarily mean that a practice or approach is ineffective, but it does point to the need for more systematic evaluation of effects. I think that some of DITU's research on the enhanced choice model, which I'm sure will come on to at some point, is a great step in that direction. And um, what we hope is that that maybe this paper will prompt some of some of that research. So well, actually, I think that uh, Jen really segs nicely into let's just start talking about the, the trauma-informed care framework. Uh, and, and I think a, a first question, which you know, you, you sort of mentioned briefly in the paper, but it's kind of one of those things you can't know until you ask the people who wrote it is how did you start developing this framework? Because we're talking about, you know, information that is often coming from a lot of other fields, maybe related, but not, you know, with one-to-one correspondence to behavior analysis. There aren't a lot of evidence-based practices that you can just sort of pull, like, here's what works perfectly, and here's how it relates to behavior analysis. So, you you really didn't have something that you could just say, oh, we'll just copy this. It'll look exactly the same. And we'll just put ABA in front of it and call it a day. What was that process like, finding the information, all, all that? Lots of fun. And we had a great time doing it. It started with, as as things often do, like, I'm, I'm just thinking now of like contemporary memes of like, I did my research, but we did. <laughs> we, we started reading a lot of other kind of papers that, that, that described trauma-informed care frameworks in other disciplines. Like there's a, a wonderful toolkit for providing trauma-informed care services in homeless, uh, homeless services for battered women's shelters, places like that. And we just, we looked at those and they're expansive and they're comprehensive. Unfortunately, they don't often come with data saying, look at, look at what this process will get you. But they mm-hmm. do have very detailed descriptions of what, what the commitment means what what the concept is of of, a, of one element of the framework and then how that might look in practice. And so I, our exercise was an exercise, I think, in behavioral interpretation. And I'm talking to some Western New England grads over here. We were, we were very blessed to have been taught by the likes of Dave Palmer, Rachel Thompson, Jason Beret, Bill Ahern, who, who taught us how to interpret phenomenon that aren't necessarily subject to experimental analysis, but that might still fit within the conceptual system of, of behavior analysis. Shout out to those wonderful faculty. And so <laughs> we, we basically, we called from a, from multiple different white papers, though that which we thought was most immediately relevant to the everyday practice of ABA. And if we read something that seemed maybe a little bit that the terms weren't super amenable to behavior analysis. We engaged in the act of behavioral interpretation. We tried to provide a, a behavioral conceptualization of the concept of ensuring trust, for example. And then we also, yeah. what, once we had that down, once we kind of operationally defined these things in our own way as, as, as how we might go about talking about them or how they might incorporate into ABA services, then our job was to look to the literature, the behavior analytic literature and say, how, do we have examples where we have investigated choice provision in behavioral services and seen its impact on, say, challenging behavior or cooperative behavior uh, or things of that nature. So I think it was, mm-hmm. you know, it was first a, first an, a task of, of just reading and, and looking and seeing what other people have written about, trying to make sense of that in terms of what we do as ABA, and then trying to connect that to our, our contemporary literature, which clearly then ident- helped us identify gaps and areas where we clearly need more work to be done. Mm-hmm. Thanks for bringing that up too, I think, because I think a lot with behavior analysts, I think sometimes we're scared to look outside of our field, right? I think sometimes we're scared to contact literature from like nursing or counseling, right? Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't hit necessarily our philosophical framework, but that doesn't mean that there's not, we, there's not a lot we can learn from Mm -hmm. other people doing things. So I think it's helpful for our listeners and, you know, for me too, just to, recognize that we're not the end all be all right and that other Wait, what? People, I know and that other people have done like really good work that we could then use and make our practice better. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, it definitely feels like one of those skills, though, that I, I, I sort of always love it when, you know, like with D2 in, in general, when, when a paper like this comes out, I'm like, man, I'm glad somebody's asking those hard questions and doing that analysis. And I'll, 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 I'll go from there. But, you know, that, <laughs> that first step to jump into, because you never want to be like, I pulled this from all these other all these other research forms and I didn't maybe do the legwork. And so now I'm going outside uh, my scope of practice a little too much with you're pulling too much from, from too many disparate sources. But so. they did the legwork. Right. So. Oh no, that's why I love it when somebody to, else does. That's what's <laughs> about our field right and, now. And to so be many. honest, we weren't sure how this article was going to be received. We submitted it with some trepidation and just kind of braced ourselves for the reviews that were going to come back. <laughs> and much to our delight, light, we had an incredibly supportive AE, Lauren Beaulieu, yeah. and the, the anonymous reviewers were so helpful in shaping the paper and, and bringing out points. And, and the response that we've had from colleagues has been really overwhelmingly positive. And I think that that really speaks to maybe a bit of a change in, mm-hmm. in behavior analysis and, and how we're, we're thinking about things, or that there are probably loads of pockets of good practice that we don't even know about with regard to, to trauma-informed care. And, and hopefully we'll start bringing more of that to the forefront. I'd just like to also add that, like, to go off of what Jackie said earlier, it's it's incredibly humbling to go read from other disciplines and find out that they're, that they're doing great work and that they're probably dealing with similar issues. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if y'all felt this. I remember when I was in graduate school, that it was there was this this sort of euphoria of, of becoming a radical behaviorist and being like, oh my God, everybody needs to know this, this worldview, <laughs> you know? And then you kind of get knocked down a few pegs as, as life comes yep. at you fast. Mm-hmm. This, this process was, was a nice blend of those things where it's like, it's mm-hmm. both amazing to see how other disciplines are conceptualizing of, of similar issues and problems. But I still felt at the end of the day that behavior analysis has a role to play in, in all of these in all of these facets that the the mm-hmm. the clarity with which yeah. we define our terms and and we understand behavior environment relations i think could prove mm-hmm. really useful in addressing similar challenges in other contexts and in areas where behavior analysts don't commonly practice i think it's well well said d2 and and i i think for 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 younger students or students who are just starting to you know start their graduate work, that idea of behavior analysis knows everything, but I can't focus outside of behavior analysis or I'm being unethical. You know, you can give other people you work with like a couple minutes to hear their point and, and have a genuine curiosity as to what they're telling you before you flat out tell them like, that's not an evidence-based practice. Get out of my way. Mm-hmm. I know what I'm doing. But so much of it is behavior. I mean, just behavioral interpretation exactly. of different viewpoints. And often we're all saying similar things, Yep. even if we're not saying it in, in the same way. Precisely. Yeah. Unless your goal is to be the least liked person at the place you <laughs> work, it's to just tell everyone they're wrong and your science is right, and you're not even going to try to figure out. That's if the two not can what go we're together. doing. We're not doing. We're, of that. course, we're not no. doing that. Not no, us. It's not our goal. No. For sure. Well, you, you should call this ABA outside track because <laughs> <laughs> everyone's invited. <laughs> that is actually very true. Everyone is invited. Yeah. Yeah, I and mean, I may have said this at some point before, but. It's true that as radical behaviors, I think we bring a really unique perspective to our understanding of of behavior and how the world works. And it's that piece that makes us so special is thinking about behavior and contiguous causation, right? Like our understanding of behavior being informed by its consequences is, is quite unique to our perspective. And for students learning about behavior analysis, you have to like strip it down to that. But then there's also a piece where we need to build it back up, right? Mm -hmm. And build back in the complex contextualization that's going to occur in the A part of the A, the B, and Mm -hmm. the C. And what I've started doing with my students is when I talk about the A, the B, and the C, I draw the A in this big giant circle and then a smaller B and then even smaller C, Hmm. right? Because we, I mean, at least me, I was trained so much with the focus on the C, right? How are we going to change behavior with our focus on the C? But everything that's happening in that A is incredibly important. And some of it's happening in the moment, right? And that's occasioning behavior. But there's other aspects of that A environment that are, you know, covert behavior, internal stimuli, proprioceptive stimulation, and history 
that are all also influencing behavior in the moment and having, you know, you got you to take it down to say, consequences are super important. This is how our, we understand theoretically behavior, right? But then building it back up to say, but it's not just about the consequence. It's about this whole contextualization that's going to allow us to understand behavior for, and it's individualized. Super. No? Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, agree- <laughs> you were just, shaking your head. I was shaking the agree- in, in agreement. <laughs> I like that. He's like, no, I don't okay, know good. where. Could you imagine if I just came from. in like, um, actually, no. the seat's pretty important, Diana. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the seat is important, but we don't have a C without an A. Just True. put it out there. <laughs> we don't. Okay. <laughs> Do you want to be a VCBA? Sure, we all do. Now you can come to Regis College in Weston, Mass. to get your graduate degree. Choose from any one of these courses. Masters of Science in Applied Behavior Analysis. Masters of Science in Special Education. Dual degree in Special Ed and ABA. Or be eligible for your post-master certificate. You can complete your degree and be ready to sit for the exam in two years. And our 2017 grads had a 100% pass rate on the BACB exam. Come enjoy practicum placement support, ethics mini handbooks, PhD level professors, small class sizes, and a service trip to Iceland. If interested, don't delay. Supplies are limited. Learn more at regiscollege.edu. Again, that's www.regiscollege.edu. RegisCollege.edu. One more time, www.regiscollege.edu. See you there. Sorry, everyone. I have to pause our conversation for a quick second to remind you all that ABA Inside Track is ACE approved. By listening to this episode, you're able to earn one learning credit. Huzzah! All you need to do is finish listening, then go to our website at abainsidetrack.com slash get CEUs, that's G-E-T hyphen C-E-U-S. You need to enter in some information there, including these two code words. We're going to give you the first one of those code words that we've hidden in the episode right now, and that is whale, W-H-A-L-E. It's a largest mammal, or one of them can be. The blue whale is the largest mammal on earth. We're going to do whales the country, but we thought, well, it might be too easy to guess. So we went with the (laughs) similar sounding, but totally different whale, like the big one that swallowed Jonah or Pinocchio, right? Whale. All right, back to our conversation. All right, so let's get it. Let's get into the framework. We've we've been dancing around the issue this whole episode. Let's talk about what are the points of the framework. So we got four main points laid out in the paper. I know you you spent so much time working, you know, with each other, with your authors about putting these in order. Would you be okay if we started with emphasize skill building first? Of course. Yeah. Okay, just because that seems to be of the four, the one that. Kind of was the shorter of the of the four sections because it was, you know, skill acquisition. I think we got this. I think this is an area that we do pretty well on. Check. So for me, I like yeah, to start. We, start we, are the, <laughs> we are the skill building experts. Mm-hmm. So that's that's one box we can we can definitely check as as behavior analyst. I'd say, however, one potential area for growth for us as a field is the ways that we involve clients in the selection of skills that are meaningful to Mm -hmm. them. Because I'd argue that any behavioral goal needs to be based on the values that are important to the person. And I'm not sure that that always happens. When I work with children and adolescents, and of course, I have the benefit that the clients that I work with can speak to me and talk to me about things. But we begin with a discussion about what behaviors they want to change. And and we don't always phrase it that way, but we start by defining what's important to them, which often takes the form of what would you like to be different about your, your life and whatever they respond following up with, well, what would that give you? And that helps us identify the values that are important, the things that are important, and then we can start building the skills that help them accomplish that. So I think we know how to build skills. 
in terms of a trauma-informed framework, I think the work is around who selects those skills and how those skills are selected and the degree to which they are really honoring what the individual feels is important. So I think it makes perfect sense why that would be the last one on the list, because if you go through the first, I, I know I, I know they weren't written as like, this is step one, step two, step three. But if you sort of think about the kind of the other components of the framework, it's going to do a lot of the legwork for the, okay, here's our skill building mm-hmm. goal, because we, we sort of know what's important to the client. We know what we need to do in terms of making it a you know, safe, appropriate environment. And then the details of the actual learning new skills, you know, we, we have a pretty good sense in, in, in many cases what to do. So why don't we talk about kind of those other those other big pieces? And we'll start with the, the first one you bring up, which is just the idea of acknowledging trauma and that it has a potential impact. Sure. I think we can maybe go through it relatively quickly because we've sort of been talking about it this whole time. Right? Yeah. The, 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 what, what we're talking about is that it's likely more prevalent than we know. The numbers are sort of staggering in terms of how many children have experienced at least one traumatic event. And then, and then those that have experienced more than one are still pretty high. Folks who are, who are intellectually and developmentally disabled are at much differentially greater risk for experiencing trauma. Furthermore, the kind of the, the metrics that we use to categorize traumatic stress disorders or, or symptoms are at, at, at this point in time almost exclusively kind of like verbal report methods, questionnaires, surveys, mm-hmm. things that you go to the doctor, you fill it out. Typically, a, a parent or caregiver might fill it out on behalf of their child, but you might they do have ones where the child can fill it out depending on their kind of language level. And then we make a judgment about whether or not they have post-traumatic stress disorder, and then we might filter them down into some particular treatment path. Well, that clearly doesn't necessarily fit for a large majority of those with who, who we provide ABA service to services to who don't have strong language skills, who may not necessarily be equipped to fill out those surveys. But that doesn't mean that they haven't experienced something traumatizing, that they may have they may not have really adverse reactions and responses to certain stimuli that we are aware or unaware of. So this first kind of commitment is like just just is 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 assuming the prevalence of it and assuming the possibility that any client that you work with, any family that you work with may have trauma that they're that they may report to you, but that, that may also go unreported. And I think that Jackie, you you said something similar to it earlier. If you if you kind of go in with that assumption it really might change a lot about the decisions that you make in terms of treatment planning, treatment development, the some of the some of the procedures that we are, are so proud of as behavior analysts may not necessarily work in in those types of settings. So we kind of like to think of acknowledging trauma and its potential impact as this as this gateway that that opens the door for you to engage in more trauma informed practice. It's I, I yeah, I liken it to sort of how skepticism as a scientific commitment opens the door for us to be to be critical thinkers, acknowledging the the the, the potential that our clients have trauma and the impact of that trauma opens the door for us to be a little bit more analytic and 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 careful in our treatment planning. So when we get to kind of the, the second part, so ensure safety and trust. I know for me reading this section, I, I started read the header. Like, oh, safety and trust. That's I, I want children to trust me. I want to create a safe environment. I want my clients to feel that I'm going to do what I say. That's all there is to it, right? And it was it was really just amazing to read that it's a, it's a little bit more than just a commitment to, I hope people trust me or I want to make a safe mm-hmm. environment, that there are some more direct steps or direct whether it's procedural or whether it's more in, in terms of your kind of philosophy of what form my treatment will take, you know, sort of what what should be done or what should be in mind when, when kind of creating these environments. So, you know, what what are some of the pieces that we need to be aware of when we are trying to ensure safety and trust? Yeah, he, here's where I feel I, I I feel as though it's it's really important to think about some of our experiences for for each behavior analyst to reflect on clients with whom they've worked. And think about the things that you may or may not have done in the name mm-hmm. of safety. And, and mm-hmm. that's something that, that is, as, as I started off with, like it, it stuck with me. It keeps me up at night when I think about some of the th- procedures that I've done, some of the physical interventions that I've kind of arranged or been a part of or coordinated in the name of what we thought was safest for the child. And we have notes in our literature. We have a handbook that, that, that kind of espouses that these things are, are safety measures and that they're always done in the name of safety. But there is the, the A matters, right, Diana? So like when we, mm-hmm. when an individual engages in dangerous behavior in, in a moment, and we're, we're not necessarily sure why in that particular moment, but we do what, what we believe is safest, and we physically restrain that child to keep everybody safe. Yes, that might make them safe in the moment, but then they are then na- navigating an environment replete with individuals who 
restrained them and, and who, who, mm-hmm. who have gear on that suggests I, I've done it before. I'll do it again. And the, the part that makes me really, what gets me worked up is that some of these learners are engaging in behavior. We, we don't know the extent to which they're aware, self-aware of the behaviors that they engage in that result in those restraints. We, we don't know how strong the contingency is between, Oh, when I threw this spoon, my, the staff restrained me or, or escorted me to a, to a safe location. That's the extreme side of the coin is ensuring safety kind of, I think really means revisiting the conditions under which we implement physical intervention. We're, I'm not saying, and I don't think Jen is saying, and any of our co-authors are saying that we need to eradicate restraint because there, there's likely going to be a time where it's needed to keep individuals safe. And we'd rather have that in our kind of toolkit rather than not. But I think we can strongly reconsider how regularly we do it and, and, and talk, and we could strongly reconsider what warrants kind of putting individuals in restraints or seclusions, and especially if you kind of acknowledge the impact that those experiences can have from a traumatic perspective, I think that it would probably result in in, in, a, in a great reduction in the amount of, of restraints and, and seclusions that individuals are experiencing. So that's mm-hmm. the safety part. The trust part is related. Like if you, uh, if if an individual is walk, work, walking around wearing wearing a helmet and they're they're just ready to restrain, I don't know how we can assume that 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 there's going to be a trusting relationship there. Mm-hmm. I think that it's just it's it's very very difficult for that to be the case. But but I think that it, trust is a is a construct and it's hard to to conceptualize behaviorally. We kind of went with trust can be defined as as having a reinforcement history for certain approach behaviors, for certain request behaviors, knowing that when you engage in certain behaviors that somebody's going to kind of be there to work you through that. And an extension of it that I don't think we really mentioned in the paper, but trust might also be that knowing that when you're worked up, when you're distressed, when you're experiencing the effects of your own trauma, that there's there are humans there to to work through that with you, or, or at least be, mm-hmm. be there, be present with you so that maybe they're not I don't know, reinforcing each and every response during a, a sort of a, a meltdown that may be associated with some traumatic event, but that they're still there and that they're present and that they're available mm-hmm. to try to help you kind of weather the storm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like that. I like thinking about it, that they're there before it happens, during it happens, and then after, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And then there's that consistency, you know, that, you know, if I engage in this behavior, I'm, I'm, I won't be alone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think we've got to get past this idea of, oh, I can't re- reinforce any problem behavior. Right. I don't want to reinforce any tantruming or crying right. with attention. At the point that somebody is distressed, none of that right. matters. I'm going to I'm going to quote yep. Ditto, which is reinforce the behavior and live to teach another day. Mm-hmm. And I think that is is exactly what we need to be doing in terms of ensuring trust that I'm not going anywhere, no matter how, you know, I'm still here for you. I'm still supporting you and 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 not be so concerned that we're reinforcing some type of problem behavior because we really have to look at the bigger picture mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and and yeah. speaking of bigger picture the the audience for this comment terry is not any individual person i don't think maybe, maybe mm-hmm. there are bcbs out there that have the autonomy and they're like oh yeah I, I put every i put restraints in every behavior plan and that's something worth reconsidering but i think of it large as a larger cultural issue that, that there are settings in which we work where there's sort of this this culture that that these are the best ways to to maintain safety and to treat the individuals that we serve and so that doesn't fall on any individual person i think that it is something for us to all as a community come together and and reflect upon and really think about when we say we're doing this in the name of safety is it the safest thing that we could be doing in this moment? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, a lot of larger companies that I've worked with in my role and my real job have really started looking at that too. And I, it makes me happy. You know I mean? I think we have a long way to go, but I think just having, having larger companies look at it is going to be helpful for having, you know, paving the way for smaller companies to do that too. Mm-hmm. Cause where a lot of people are trained. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I love the comment you made and, the, and that you both make in, in the paper, kind of looking at like rethinking sort of, you know, oh, I'm going to ignore that problem behavior, sort of rethinking that like very specific, like dynamic of like, well, if it's attention maintained, you must remove attention and really thinking about it, about it more within this framework, which I consult in, in public school. So I think everyone just kind of figured out that, oh yeah, behaviors caused by consequences. Got it. So I should remove. And it's like, well, actually, uh, I know I've been telling you that for years, but wait, 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 wait for it. Okay. Do it differently now. Throw you a wrinkle under this plan. And some people might tell me, that's what I used to do. And you told me not to do (laughs) that. That's so true. (laughs) It's like, my bad. I'm sorry. I'm learning too. (laughs) Right. But we're operating under this assumption that, oh no, if we say anything or do anything, we're going to reinforce this behavior. But you know, not all behavior 
is even even going to be maintained mm-hmm. in that way. Mm-hmm. And like you said, Jen, in the moment, it's you know that that's not a learning opportunity, right? If someone is escalated, that's that one hundred percent. Yeah, right? mm-hmm. and so much of the you know perception of what we do, I think the negative perception of what we do is wrapped up in that idea of planned ignoring. And it's usually not necessary (laughs) and creates that stilted, discompassionate interaction piece that's really uh, driving, I think, a lot of the negative perception Mm -hmm. in our field. And and that too is a, is a, a, another cultural kind of, shift that I think it would be great if it happens. I I remember being a graduate student, being in the grocery store, seeing the mom reinforcing a stranger child's kind of tantrum and being like, oh my Mm -hmm. God, can you believe what the, that they're, that they're reinforcing that, you know, like they need Mm -hmm. to be ignoring it. And I don't know anything about what's going on, but now I'm, I'm so happy that like in 2022, I reflect back on that and think, they were actually probably doing the right thing by being available to their child, by being like, I'm not going to get you the Kit Kat, but I love you. Like, come here. Like, let, let yeah. me just hug you and mm-hmm. coddle you a little bit. That That's yeah. actually perhaps a more beautiful way to do extinction than just, I'm just going to ignore you in this grocery yeah. store <laughs> while you, you may, maybe tear up some shelves right. and then yeah. we get back to it. That's, that's not, uh, that's a, a systemic issue that might also relate to our training programs and the way that we kind of teach that these things are sort of binary in their nature that you either reinforce mm-hmm. or you extinguish. But I think that there's a lot of shape gray area in between. So uh, the last section of the the framework that we have not we, we discussed a little bit would be the idea of promoting choice and shared govern, governance in our in our treatments or in our procedures. So, you know, what what are the what are the pieces there that we should be keeping in mind? Is it you know more just you know thinking about sort of like the, the enhanced choice procedure that you've are, you, you've done research on? Is it, is it bigger than that? Well, I think choice is critical in a TIC framework because it allows people to experience control of their environment in a way that helps promote self-determination and build self-efficacy. And we certainly have loads of research and behavior analysis on the benefits of choice and the number of ways that choice can be embedded into behavioral programs. And this includes choice of treatment and the choice not to participate in treatment as, as we see so beautifully in the in the enhanced choice model. And I think that that relates to the, the idea of shared governance, which is that individuals should be, their voices should be heard in planning the, the treatments that, that are used with them. I really think that that we need to, to shift from a model where we are doing behavior analysis to people and doing behavior analysis with them instead. Mm-hmm. And that is that is shared governance at its heart. And despite all we know about the importance of choice, however, we cite an article by Ferguson et al. that showed that of the 140-something articles they reviewed, it was a paper on social validity, that only 6% of those had evidence that participants were given a choice with regard to intervention. Mm-hmm. Now, the degree to which that reflects clinical practice is less clear, but I think there there definitely might be some room for improvement in terms of incorporating choice as standard practice in our behavioral procedures. Having said that, incorporating choice has some risks. Bannerman et al. several decades ago highlighted some of those. One of those is that sometimes the people that we work with don't make good choices. (laughs) So it's sometimes difficult to implement those choice-making procedures. So what that points to is maybe a need to teach people how to evaluate options and and discriminate before we launch into providing lots of choices. Actually, Ditu, Holly Gover, and I just finished writing a paper that acknowledges some of these difficulties and, and tries to distill the behavioral choice literature into a practical guide for, for clinicians. So we'll see if anybody wants to publish that. (laughs) I need that too. (laughs) I mean, to be fair, though, we all make bad choices at one point or another, right? So I think even making speak bad, for yourself, Jackie. Yeah. I mean, even making bad choices, I think, it is good to as you know, like making bad choices can also give us consequences that may lead us to make good choices in the future, mm-hmm. right? We just have to make sure they're not like 
all the way bad choices. I sure love you playing in traffic. Sure you giving the opportunity to make a choice. Truly, yes. yeah. I, I think I reflect on that number a lot, like 6%. That's quite low. Mm-hmm. And I, 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 I agree with Jen that we don't know how that reflects in practice. But based off of mm-hmm. what I've seen, I think I see a, quite a few situations where choice is not provided when it when it kind of could be. And again, yeah. I kind of think about what are the potential variables that, that are influencing that. And, and to me, I can recall planning treatments and thinking like, if we promote choice here, where does it end? You know, if you give it, give, mm-hmm. give a learner an inch, they might take a mile. And if they're not able to then handle when they don't have choices, that's a problem. So let's just avoid mm-hmm. offering the choices on the front end. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. I, I think that a critical, you know, dovetail between promoting choice and emphasizing skill building is that we strongly encourage incorporating choice making opportunities into service delivery, but that should also probably be coupled with explicit teaching of how to handle when you can't be given a choice or how to handle when your mm-hmm. choices can't be reinforced immediately. Yes. Right. And mm-hmm. I, I think those things taken together could be a really robust, resilient kind of set of skills for an individual to have. Mm-hmm. That's very true. So we've got four points of our framework. We've got the acknowledging trauma and its potential impact, ensuring safety and trust, promote choice and shared governance, and then emphasize skill building, which we talked about. But if we put it back at the end like it is in the paper, okay, well, now that you've answered these other three parts of your procedure and protocol, it makes it a lot easier to figure out what skills are going to be relevant. Maybe it is that, you know, understanding no. Maybe it is, you know, more about kind of thinking about like tolerating certain prompts that you know will be helpful and that the individual might be willing to do, but wasn't when you started the treatment. So you have to make it, you know, a part of your overall procedure. So we've got a framework, but what does it look like in practice? You know, and, and I, and I know that that's, that's not a question you're going to, Oh, it looks exactly like this every single time. (laughs) But maybe, maybe if it's if easy, both, yeah, just do this. <laughs> just, but maybe if, if both of you would share kind of some thoughts about, you know, it could look like, or it might look like, you know, in terms of when you were sort of writing the paper and imagining, I, I don't know about you, I can't read a paper that thinking of a client I've worked and saying, exactly. Oh, I should have done that. Or, Oh, I'm going to mm-hmm. do this. But what would a trauma informed framework as part of your practice look like? Just some examples. Sure. I'd love to start with intake. You meet somebody for the first time, you know that they have experienced some trauma or you don't know that they've experienced some trauma. And what that sets us up with is there's a boogeyman out there. There might be some stimulus Mm -hmm. in the room, something that you present that might result in such an adverse reaction that then you need to, for safety, engage in mm-hmm. some sort of physical management procedure. We don't want to start that way. So I think that mm-hmm. I think that being trauma informed at the outset suggests that we don't jump right to some of the common aversive events that might, you know, evoke challenging behavior. That might be putting too many expectations in place, or, or particular types of expectations in place. That might be really, really thinning access to some preferred items for no reason at all. So like, mm-hmm. I, I think that it's a, it's a good starting point to start from a place of, of absolute awesomeness and joy and, and, and let learners experience a new context with a new individual because that's another thing to think about is as new individuals, we might ourselves just be aversive stimuli because we're, we're unfamiliar, mm-hmm. but we may have somebody might have a history of not having good experiences with unfamiliar mm-hmm. people. So we want to come in we want to be familiar as soon as we can. We want to let learners really control their environment to the extent possible. Of course, this is easy to say and hard to implement, but, mm-hmm. but we, I do think even if it's a student in a classroom of 20, that there are ways that you can kind of give them a little bit of special treatment and, 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 and enhance their experiences on, on the front end so that they can trust you and so that they can trust that, that they're not entering this new environment where there might be snakes, you know, uh, on the walls or, or inside this box. Next, I think mm-hmm. it's, it's critical to just constantly monitor for signs of distress and for negative emotional responses. So when we are like, all right, now it is day three, I think it's time to start doing some of this academic work. That's why you're here. It's critical to recognize that early signs of protest or early signs of, I don't really want to, or, or, or early signs of kind of challenging behavior, that those are signals that things probably aren't going to get better if we keep pushing through this expectation right now. And it's also, Mm -hmm. to me, a clear indicator that the learner doesn't necessarily have skills to help navigate that particular context. If they had strong self-advocacy skills, they might be able to say, hey, I'd really rather not do math. Do you mind if I just finish this video game before I get to it? And if we're not seeing that, instead we're seeing, oh, I don't want to do this, or why do you guys always do this to me? That's a sign for me for for a behavior analysis to take place and for us to kind of teach Mm -hmm. skills there. But importantly, in that moment, to kind of back off, go back to that 
that baseline of, of, of well, why don't we go back to things where you feel a little bit more comfortable here? Because that sends a really strong message to these learners that we're not here to traumatize them, that we're not here to, mm-hmm. to put them through stuff that they're not ready for yet, and that we are, in fact, listening every step of the way, and that we are kind of sensitive to their, to their needs at every moment. I think those are a couple things. But, and, and then I guess like a, a final thing is like every opportunity in which you observe kind of behavior that seems undesirable or seems challenging is an opportunity to teach alternative skills. And so mm-hmm. we could really look to our, our behavior analytic literature, which is really so excellent in teaching communicative skills, cooperation skills, tolerate, to, like coping skills. And I think that kind of, for my money, I think that those are important skills to teach toward the front end of services so that a, a learner can advocate for themselves across myriad contexts in which we're programming potentially novel, potentially challenging, and yes, potentially traumatizing expectations. Yeah, I think that assent and consent, consent is really important. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think that allowing learners to withdraw assent throughout treatment is important, but especially in that beginning when we're developing a yeah. relationship, because that's mm-hmm. that's just uh, that to me is how you develop a good relationship. Is like, yep, I, I'm here for you, and I'm here to learn with you. Jen, do you, were there any other any other kind of examples of sort of you know a, a day in the life of the trauma informed care practitioner? Some some things that that. Yeah, I think that in working with some of the children and adolescents that that I work with, the process is is much the same to what what did you described. We do know that there are often some core deficiencies in skills that these kids have around their emotional understanding. So, so building up those skills and really having that focus on not trying to reduce behaviors that are viewed as problematic, but figuring out the skills that are missing and working on those skill building so that those, those other problem behaviors become less necessary and less important to those kids. And and as I mentioned before, there's also very much a sense of transparency and talking about the types of interventions and asking questions and that not assessing social validity after it's already happened, but being proactive about social validity and saying, here's what we're, we're thinking about, this is what we would like to do, and how would that feel for you? And does that seem like something that would work for you? And, and how can we fix it if it doesn't feel that way? So sometimes you have to start at a point that's not exactly the intervention that you wanted to do, but, but build up to that as you build that, that trust and, and safety. I love that. I love that you, you know, brought in the Wolf 78 article. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we in our field focus a lot on Wolf's number three point on social validity, right? So the overall validity of the efficacy of our outcomes. But the other two pieces of that social validity paper are, are we selecting the right goals to start with? And number two, which is incredibly important, is are the means by which we're teaching this skill valid. And I think that that gets overlooked mm. quite a lot. Oh, yeah. I just taught it to one of my classes this past week. We read the paper and everything's in there. He says it all. Like yes, it, it's not, not only does he emphasize the importance of these things, but there's a really brilliant kind of note that you can use social validity as a mechanism for feedback and as a mechanism to change the way that you're doing things. And so mm-hmm. if that is only something that we do at the end, and then we say, thank you for this feedback, we'll try to use it with our next clients. That's right. helpful, helpful to some degree, but it's not as helpful for that client. So if we can just kind of change the order in which we do things, like like Jen mentioned, that might be a really wonderful way for us to, like, why not start with a treatment that we think that they're going to like to implement, that they're going to like to experience, mm-hmm. or that caregivers might like to implement. And I just have to, as a side, this doesn't pertain, but Montrose Wolf is like the most powerful name. <laughs> I was, I was, right? I was just thinking that, Jack. You know, I... Like, you said Wolf 78, and I'm like, oh, that sounds like a cool movie. I can't wait to right? go see it. It's like, like, like his, if his mom, like, was like, I'm going to call you Montrose. Like, I've been thinking a lot about that. you will rule millions we, one day. Right? Because yeah. <laughs> I have been also, we, we talked about that in yeah. our class last week, too, and... <laughs> I just had to share in syllabi. Yeah. (laughs) And we, we stopped. I like, I was like, and here's a picture. And this man's name is Montrose. (laughs) And everyone's like, okay. And I'm like, that's an amazing name. The picture of him in the, in the striped. The polo shirt. The polo shirt with the really. Wait, you know what picture it is? That's. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) That's like the picture, isn't it? Remember Diana and I, our lives are very interwoven. Yeah. (laughs) Sure. But Yeah. 
I pulled right. that picture up because it's <laughs> that was oh. good. Oh. All right. Well, aside. <laughs> with that, with that being said, let's move into dissemination station. <laughs> I was, I was worried, Jag, I tricked you. You were too busy looking at Montrose Wolf pictures to uh, <laughs> do the sound effect. I do have like a slight crush on him. I'd like he to have d- tea with him. At yeah, some he does point, have a lot though. of like amazing, amazing work he's mm-hmm. done. You know, and you, and you and you read about it or some of the things you're like, wait, that was him too. <gasps> you know, yeah. But anyway, as much as we'd love to just talk about Montrose Wolf and this dissemination station, we Fan club. get back get back to the topic. So I'll be honest, I read through the framework. I read through kind of, you know, some of the ideas for practice and then continuing to, to have this discussion today. I'm all in. This sounds great to me. Sign me up. I'm ready for it. So we're done, right? That's it. We did it. We, we, we got it all we set. We did it. Behavior analyzed. <laughs> but you know as as we've already talked about a few times there are still a number of questions that we want to make sure that we're answering even though we can start a number of these practices today what are what would you say are kind of the biggest questions still left out there to to answer or alternatively what are the quickest and easiest questions that we totally should answer first cuz we could get those answers you know in a shorter amount of time the two, you may have a different perspective, but I'm not sure it's about the questions that are easy wins at this point, but maybe particularly on the research side of things that we're doing a better job of reporting trauma histories, as we said a few times before, getting more comfortable about asking about those things, reporting any of the target behaviors that that might be related to those histories when we describe participants so that we know within our research literature, what proportion of people are we working with that have those tri- histories? And, and for some of those histories will be unknown, but I think it's important for us to start asking the question and including that that information. And then any adjustments that we are making to our procedures that are made because of those histories or things that we tried and they didn't work and and how we had to adjust them. Because I think that's some of the stuff that's really needed. And we we have the anecdotes from clinical practice about how we've done that, but, but don't really have the data. I think we also need to think about broader measures rather than you know, just the target behavior, what are some of those other types of measures that might be important to collect that may signify that we are not using a trauma-informed future that we are? Things like how many times are clients refusing to come to, to mm-hmm. sessions? That That's a big one. Yeah. We want clients to run to us, not from us. And if they're running away, then then something is has gone wrong. Evidence of emotional distress, crying and and problem behavior is often a a target, but really digging down to is something that we're doing appearing to cause some emotional distress and, and collecting data on that and seeing how that reduces across time. So I think those are some of the things that we can start incorporating in what we're doing right now that will start answering some of the questions about how we use behavior analytic strategies for individuals with trauma histories. Yeah. And I I think that as we continue to do that research, I don't think that we need to wait until it's all done for us to have a fully understood evidence base for trauma-informed care procedures. But I I, I think that it's important for us to kind of ask some of the questions that have come up during this podcast, like what are the variables that are that are giving rise to certain practices in certain organizations. We're now at a place in ABA where there are kind of these long-standing institutions that have been around, and then there's also a new ABA agency every other day that's, mm-hmm. that's coming up, and, and private equity is kind of taking over in, in many different ways. But there are going to be practices that when you when you hire somebody into a new company, they're just bringing what, they've, what they're used to, what they've done in their old practice and things like that. And so I think broader questions about implementation and perhaps de-implementation, like how do we, how do we understand the variables that, that inform your, your decision-making and clinical planning, and how do we maybe go about adjusting that so that we can introduce some of these notions that might be more trauma-informed? That would be really great for us to ascertain while we're kind of learning the, the relative or comparative or, or just the absolute effects of trauma-informed care procedures on the behaviors that we care about. And I think the way that we train students is important oh. as well, and that we are 
acknowledging and talking about trauma from the outset. Ditu was was visiting me in, in Wales and we were teaching one of our master's courses t- together and talking to the students about trauma and enhanced choice model and, and that sort of thing. And and I think Ditu and I had a moment in that where we were ref- really reflecting on how this training was different from some of the training we received ourselves. Mm-hmm. And I think incorporating, given the the prevalence of trauma, not only in the general population, but also the higher likelihood that the individuals that we work with, individuals with with intellectual disabilities and autism and, and young children, are at a higher risk for experiencing those things that we are talking about it when we're training students from the outset. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I just have to jump in and, and compliment Jen Austin and her colleagues because it was like truly mind blowing to be in their institution and to, 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 to hear their students. I went around, we started the class. I was like at the front of the room and I was like, could everybody just say something briefly about what they want to do in ABA? And everybody's like, I want to help these vulnerable populations and I want to do so in the safest, most humane and dignifying way possible. And these are, these are kids and they're just, it's like, that's their, they, it, it, it follows that if that's your introduction to ABA, if you're introduced to a Jen Austin and they're, yeah. and they're talking about trauma at the forefront, that these aren't things that you need to unlearn and relearn in your four, 30s and 40s mm-hmm. as a practitioner, mm-hmm. but rather that you're, you're entering the field with that energy, with that attitude, with the awareness of the shots being fired of the, of the folks that aren't really too pleased with, with ABA services as they currently are. And and a, a, a reflection in the mirror of, of, no, 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 this isn't something for us to just rebut and then move on. It's something for us to actively wear on our sleeve and, and, and work, you know, and work toward. Yeah, it gives me a lot of hope for the future of our field, honestly, is I'll, I'll say things to students that I, that for me would have been super controversial in my graduate training. And I think that it's going to completely throw them for a loop. And they're like, yeah, of course. Why would we not do it that way? Right? So like- (laughs) These young people and their positive attitudes. Exactly. There are many folks in our field who are ready for this type of sea change. And I'm excited that it's happening and that so many- incredibly smart people in our field are contributing to that change. I'm also so amazed to see how many autistic BCBAs there are, how many autistic students there are, neurodivergent allies and members of the neurodiverse community who are joining the field. And I think if I'm just thinking if I was in a class where I had a a classmate who was autistic and we were talking about these papers where we describe these kids with autism and we talk about the procedures that we use, that might have been really, really impactful on on how -hmm. how we talk about it and how we how we respond to the, the things that we read about and learn about. And I'm, I'm so sure. amazed by it. Well, I think everyone's brought up some great, great points in terms of for folks listening, if you are a graduate professor we or an advisor or a mentor, <laughs> everyone's the best. Some, some great ways to talk about this would be to start talking about it with your students who are at a position in their careers where they are interested in learning the most and you could start them on the right track where they don't, like you said, you do have to unlearn a number of things and <laughs> unlearn a number of practices. For everyone else out there, if you had to sort of pick an area, if, if you're able to, because I know we're talking about a big framework, which can sometimes be hard to talk about the component analysis of, but if you had an area that you would recommend for someone who is practicing, who is in that process of trying to learn and maybe unlearn a few things, is there kind of one point of the framework or one area in kind of trauma-informed care as a whole that you might recommend that they they start by thinking about or start by trying out with with their clients or, or with stakeholders even maybe in, in their intake process that you would say, you're going to pick one, start here, see how it goes, and then build your skill set from there? I have a thought, Jen. What about you? I have some thoughts, but go ahead, uh, too. <laughs> I, I think if you're just starting somewhere, uh, like the thing that to me you could pick up and you could do tomorrow is to, to incorporate some choice-making opportunities into, into practice. That, that there are situations you could think about, okay, when it's time to do this work, do I give my learner the choice to do some, one work over the other? If I don't, why not? Am I afraid that if, they, if I do that, they'll only choose math because they're good at math, but they hate reading? If so, like what, you know, uh, t- to me, pr- incorporating choice-making opportunities you could do today, tomorrow, it will likely, the data do seem pretty clear on this, it's likely to facilitate cooperation rather than inhibit it. It's likely to mitigate challenging behavior rather than increase it. And so to me, that seems like an easy one. And, and on top of that, I also think well, this might not be as easy to, to incorporate tomorrow, but offering the choice to participate in one's therapy or not is something that I think is becoming increasingly important. That is to be able to withdraw their assent from that which we are arranging for them. Seems seems like an important starting point. 
w- again, that might be like, oh my God, if I do that, they're just going to choose to not participate. But isn't, aren't those the data that we, that we desperately need is, is, mm-hmm. is an indicator that what we're arranging is not indeed preferred or, or that all that reinforcing for our learners. So, so to me, broadly speaking, I think incorporating choice making is something you could do tomorrow if you're a little agnostic or a little ambivalent. And then if you like, if you like what you get, then you might consider these other commitments as well. I think that, that that's a great suggestion to do. It's a bit hard to separate them out and say, what's the one that you could, could kind of start tomorrow? Probably choices is maybe the easiest to think about what that would look like. But I think we also can't underestimate the importance of ensuring safety and trust and making sure that that is the starting point for everything that we do and that the skills that we are selecting as targets that we are really thinking about how is this meaningful to this person? I think we often make the assumption that we know best and and maybe we don't. So we really need to be thinking about how the skills that, that we're teaching will make some type of meaningful difference in this person's life. I think the other thing that I would suggest to behavior analysts, and this relates to our discussion before about looking outside of of behavior analysis, is you're not going to find a lot about trauma if you're sticking only with the behavioral literature. There are some books that I would really recommend that that behavior analysts read. One is The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk, Nadine Burke Harris's book called Toxic Childhood Stress. Bruce Perry's book called The Boy That Was Raised as a Dog. All of these give such insight into the experience of trauma and what that means to individuals who have ex- who have had those experiences. And I, I think that's something that we really need to get to grips with. And it's, it's related to all of those other trauma-informed skills. So I think that that, that type of reading is, is particularly important. Yeah. I've been really fortunate that folks that have, for whom this paper has resonated, have reached out and they've been like, we're doing a journal club. Would you like to kind of pop in? And I think that I've, I've learned, it's been amazing. I think that I can't recommend enough to, to consider these things in a community and not on an island. So mm-hmm. if, you're, if you're a BCBA operating in any, any type of setting, ideally you have other colleagues, either on an interdisciplinary team or other BCBAs. And, and thinking through these things from a structural level and a programmatic level is better in, in with company. Well, Dr. Austin, Dr. Rajaraman, thank you so, so much for being on the show today. We really appreciate you getting the chance to have a conversation about this topic, about your uh, your work, and to pick your brain about some other ideas that, you know, just because of the length of articles can be, you, it's hard to type them in. So thank you so much for that. If listeners are interested in reaching out, apparently, D2, you'll show up at, at every journal club. Yep. You know. I'm very lonely, <laughs> so just give me a call. <laughs> 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 or if they'd like to reach out to talk more about the article or to ask for maybe some help finding resources from other fields to promote work that they're doing, you know, might not have been published in Java yet, or who knows if it'll ever be published in, in uh, your kind of our, 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 you know, spheres of literature. Would you mind sharing your contact information? I can be reached at a Rajaraman. That's R A J A R A M A N at umbc.edu for the next few months. And then I'll let you know when I get a new uh, email address. <laughs> okay. okay. And you can contact me at Jen with two N's dot Austin at South Wales dot AC dot UK. One more time, I want to say a big, big thank you to Dr. Adichin Rajaraman and to Dr. Jennifer Austin for coming on the show, talking to us all about these advances in trauma-informed care and the trauma-informed care framework that they are proposing for behavior analysts. I don't know about you, I told them a little bit off air, but I am very much in the bag for this line of work. And I'm very, very excited to take some of the extra information they shared that wasn't able to to fit into the confines of the research paper into my own practice. And I hope you are feeling the same way too. And if not, hey, shoot them an email or shoot us an email to let us know your thoughts on the matter or maybe where you want to get some more information. Although I think D2 and Jen are the ones you want to email if you want more information because they're they're right in the, the work on these subjects. I want to make sure to give that last secret code word. It is LAM, L-A-M-B, LAM. It's a baby sheep, right? Uh, they have a lot of them in Wales where Jen is a professor. So uh, if you ever go out to the University of South Wales, you'll probably see a LAM. Remember, if you're interested in getting CEs, you can go to ABA Inside Track 
patreon.com slash get CEUs, or you can click the links that we put in all of our episode postings and in your podcast player. Speaking of which, we want to thank all of you for listening to the show, and we would very much love it if you subscribe to the show, if you followed on, you know, whatever the other you know, podcast players are, but I know most of you probably subscribe on either Apple Podcasts or on Spotify, you know, Google Podcasts, all those places like that. There are a couple other ways that you can reach out to us. You can certainly follow us on social media wherever we are as ABA Inside Track. You can go to our website, abainsidetrack.com, to find links to all of the articles discussed, lists of all of the episodes we've done, as well as a place to purchase CEs if you are so inclined, and to learn a little bit more about us and our previous guests. If you'd like to listen to these episodes with a subtitling feature, you can go to youtube.com slash ABA Inside Track to get these episodes but with those subtitles. And of course, if you want even more ABA Inside Track content, we'd really love it if you joined us on patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track, where for just $5 a month, you can access discounts for our CE store, get episodes ahead of time, and access some of our special video content, including recordings of our live episodes where you can earn one CE for free. If you say, you know what, that sounds nice, but I want longer episodes, even than longer than, <laughs> than our normal length episodes, well, why not join at our premium $10 level where you can access our quarterly book club podcast. We just did our discussion of The Nurture Effect by Anthony Biglin, where we discussed how to save the world with behavioral science, a book that I know I was very, very very in love with, I guess, unlike some of our book clubs where we tend to get a little down. And I think very much in line with our topic of trauma-informed care. We also have other previous book clubs that we've done. You can access all of those, unlock all of those immediately, just subscribing at patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track. And that brings us to the end of the show. I want to again thank you all for listening. A couple other people to thank, certainly my fabulous co-hosts Jackie and Diana, as well as Dr. Jim Carr for recording our intro and outro music, Kyle Sturry for our interstitial music, and Dan Thabit of the Podcast Doctors for his editing work. We'll be back next week with another full-length episode, but until then, keep responding. Bye!